Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? If I could have my family come up and join me, please. Part of my family. i got a lot of family here. This, this section of family here. Sorry, Mom, not this time. Uh, we just got back from Nicaragua. It's been about a week now since we, since we made it home. Uh, we went with uh, our oldest two daughters. This is Abigail and Macy. If you guys would stand to the side so people can actually see you. There we go. Uh, we're going to just share a little bit about our trip before I hop into the message. Um, but we had a really great time. We have um, some family that lives down there. Uh, it's becoming more and more family that live down there. We have uh, Rachel's sister moved there roughly 20 years ago uh, and started a school with a couple other people called Tesoros de Dios, means treasures of God. It's a school that is uh, primarily, or not primarily, I mean, it's, it's 100% dedicated to uh, children with special needs. Um, it's, they're filling some huge gaps that the, a lot of the schools in that nation aren't able to provide the care for. So it's a really amazing thing that they do. And then her brother and his entire family, they have two kids as well, moved down there about a year and a half ago, I believe. And just committed to another four and a half years of serving down there. They went down originally um, just to help out at the school, uh, to serve at, at Tesoros. Uh, her brother did, and then his wife is a, a teacher that's teaching at Nicaragua Christian Academy um, in uh, Managua, Nicaragua, which is uh, the capital city of Nicaragua. And uh, he had just uh, part of their commitment to stay another four and a half years is to uh, be the lead elder of a missionary church. Uh, so a church that's geared towards missionaries that have come from the States and Canada uh, primarily to go and to, to be in Nicaragua. So it's a, it's a pretty neat community that they are a part of down there. So we're going to share a little bit about it. Uh, if you would uh, pull up some pictures. We'll start at the first slide. And Rachel, if you want to share uh, just about our time at the school. Okay, awesome. Um, and we just want to say thank you also for all your prayers and support uh, while we were there. Um, this is the sign for Tesoros de Dios, just right at the beginning. You can keep going with the pictures. Um, at the school, they do horse therapy is a big part of it. So um, Abigail and Macy got to ride the horses and work with Patrick, who is with who is there in the picture. Um, he goes through. He helps the kids like learn balance, and they do all sorts of things with the horses. So that is an aspect of it. And then this is the administrative office. So they have all different offices in that building. And you can keep going. This is going to be a vocational school. So that's like an additional um, part to the school where they get to work with kids. And like uh, their goal with working with these kids with special needs is to really get them incorporated into the community. And so some of them actually go back to their own schools. And they still work with them and bring support to the families as they need. Uh, but this is one way the vocational building will be to teach them um, to be able to do their own jobs and um, do all that. This is, oh, I think I had it backwards. This is actually the office. <laughs> the other building was the school. So um, you can keep going ahead. This is inside the school. They do um, palliative, I don't know if I can get that one. Um, it's. Um, palliative care, but they do physical therapy and do the um, work with the kids and help them like be able to move better and just teach all sorts of things. Um, this is one of the classrooms that they have. And then this playground, this was kind of a cool story, but it was donated to them when my brother was leading worship at a church last year, I believe, and this lady was like, uh, like she had a vision of this playground being donated, and she works with an organization that donates playgrounds, so they were able to give this to the school. So, yeah, so the first day we spent a uh, little time at Tesoros, and then from there we went into the country, and uh, it's a really beautiful nation. So we didn't realize it beforehand, but it is the uh, most impoverished nation in uh, Central America, second most in the Western Hemisphere behind Haiti. Um, and so it, it actually has more coastline than Costa Rica. It's, it's basically uh, Costa Rica, but a very impoverished version. The country is right next door to Costa Rica. And so we went hiking. We're at the top of a volcano. And this is me. Uh, 
That is a volcano, and that is volcanic ash that we are boarding down the side of. Uh, so quick backstory on that. Uh, we got to the top of this volcano after about an hour hike. So the first day or so, we spent just with family. We just hung out, uh, poured into them. We were able to um, really uh, bless them in, in many ways. Um, but we just had a lot of fun with them to start. And uh, it had been maybe three or four years, I think, since we'd seen her sister. Um, I, I believe it was before COVID um, that we saw her. So uh, uh, it was great. So we got to the top of this volcano, and they said, all right, so it typically takes 45 seconds to a minute to get down the side of the volcano. Somebody has done it in 15 seconds. And so I heard challenge accepted is what, like, uh, so this video is eight seconds long, and that's almost the entire volcano. So uh, the, it gets going to about 45 to 60 miles an hour uh, when, you, when, when you start ripping down the side of the volcano. So that is volcanic ash. Yes. We're just going to keep looping that throughout the message. Uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a blast. Um, so that was on Saturday. Then Sunday, if you go to the next slide, uh, we led worship at the church. This is the missionary church. It's in the a school gymnasium. Uh, I was like, oh, I cannot escape a school gymnasium. For those, <laughs> I literally got a pit in my stomach when I walked in. For those of you who don't know, we had a flood in our sanctuary, and we met in the school gymnasium for about six months. Um, it was great, though. Good opportunity. So this is the missionary church um, that her brother serves at. While we were there, we had found out that uh, there was a family that was part of the church that the father had just passed away that morning while he was in the hospital. And uh, he was a close friend of her sisters, of Michelle. And um, so they asked if we would go and do a home visit and pray for the family and uh, just speak encouragement over them. So we went and did that. And this is at the gate to their village or to their um, home compound. If you go back real quick, this is uh, – they. It's a very dangerous city, um, so these families all um, kind of live in little clusters together to to help to provide and to protect each other, and they're filled with uh, dogs that are very angry dogs, uh, very, very angry that, to help protect the family. And uh, we get to this gate, and my favorite quote of this trip was her sister's there on the left eating that orange, and she says to the kids, all right, so our main goal today uh, is to make it in and out without getting attacked by dogs. And I'm like, you do not have children, apparently. That is not how you lead the, the conversation. <laughs> and so, so we went in, and then, yes, we did make it uh, back without getting attacked by dogs. And this is, what was her name, Patricia? Um, this is a lady that was one of the co-founders of Tesoros as well. It was her uh, son's father that had passed away that morning. Uh, we're in her home. This is about maybe a six, seven foot by seven foot uh, room that, that is her home um, that we were able to visit in and to uh, pray over her. Um, this was Sunday morning after church. And then uh, from there, we went to a city called Matagalpa up in the mountain region of Nicaragua. And we uh, purchased a bunch of groceries for uh, some families that were in need. And we went in for originally just to, to provide for all of their needs. But we just while we were in the grocery store, I asked um, the lady that was leading the home visit uh, excursion and said, what are things that, like, if they had money that they wouldn't buy but that they would love? Like, the things that that are beyond their needs. And so we just load it up on all sorts of things like like bubbles, pots and pans, uh, chemicals to clean their homes, like just all sorts of things that are beyond just meeting their daily needs. And so we ended up packing a, a shopping cart that was uh, very, very full um, and, uh, and then went around to, to some homes and visited them and prayed for them. Um, this was the first family that we visited. This this lady, we actually had a word of knowledge for her. It was something with her stomach, and um, it turns out that she had just had surgery. I believe she had gotten her uh, her uterus removed, um, and so we prayed for healing for her, and then also just met some practical needs and gave some really great gifts uh, to them as well. The home visits were probably the highlight of our trip, and that's something that the girls want to want to share a little bit more about. This is another home that we visited. This is a, uh, a man by the name of Deglise. He also um, had some uh, some health issues that we 
prayed for, again, got a word of knowledge about a gallbladder, and it turned out that he was getting gallbladder surgery uh, in the next couple of weeks. And so we prayed for that, for his gallbladder. Um, he was just filled with joy, and he also was very attracted to uh, Rachel here. So I had to, uh, I had to keep him away a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's why you see me sitting right next to him. Uh, I was keeping him under control. Uh, he, he was just such a joy-filled man, though. Um, again, this is, this is their home. Behind me here on the right side uh, is, is basically just a bed. That's the bedroom, and then the, the main home is what we are all um, gathered together in. This is part of our family. Next to Rachel at the top there is Michelle, and then on the far left, her name is Anna. She re- leads the Outreach Center in Matagalpa, which is a Tesoros Outreach Center. Um, they actually go into the homes and provide physical therapy. But a big thing that they're doing is they're, act- they're teaching the parents on how to do physical therapy on their own so that they're not um, dependent on coming to the school or on somebody coming and visiting. Um, you know, this, this, this young man here, his muscles, he has uh, cerebral palsy. And so his muscles are just extremely tense. So they're teaching her um, how to make sure that, that he's able to, to live an uh, enjoyable life um, through physical therapy. So prayed for him, and then this young girl here uh, was just a complete treasure. She, we walked in. She's 17 years old. Uh, we, we walked into the home, and she could not contain the emotion. We brought uh, a bunch of gifts here as well, and uh, Abigail wants to share a little bit about our trip uh, with her. I think that the most important part of the trip was doing home visits because it was so cool seeing people with disabilities have not much stuff, get food, and a present. And one of the people that we saw when we did the home visits was this girl whose name was Guadalupe, and she is 17, but she has Down syndrome, so she looks like she's nine. And when we came into her home, she was smiling, she was smiling, hugging, and she even kissed one of us. And it was cute seeing her smile so big, and we gave her the food and present. And I learned that stuff doesn't make you happy. It's the people who you love and who you are with. Um, so, yeah, it was extremely impactful. I mean, full transparency, my kids are growing up in Ada. And uh, so it's a little bit of a difference of lifestyle that they that they had there. And that was one of the big reasons on why we wanted to go. It was to bless these families, but also so that my children could see the reality of the world and not just, uh, you know, nice little Ada in West Michigan. Uh, so it was a really impactful time for our family as well. I can't talk too much about it or I'll lose it. Uh, next home um, that we went to, oh, I must have forgotten the pictures. There's another home um, that we visited before this Young Life Camp. Let's uh, let's just stay back with uh, Guadalupe in there. One picture earlier. One more. Yeah, she's so precious. Um, but in the home visits, we visited another home of a couple of twins um, that had autism. One of them was deaf, and one was just very hyperactive. And a uh, quick testimony before Macy shares about that experience. We Right before we got in there, uh, one of the children actually um, – sucked gum up into her nose, and and it was, uh, which here, uh, you know, we can go and figure out how to get it removed, but there, they don't have access to health care, so it was actually kind of a big deal. Um, they were a little bit uh, freaking out when we got in there, and we prayed for her and found out that shortly after we left, the gum came flying out. I will leave, uh, <laughs> I'll leave the details of that, but the gum made its way out, and the, the family was very blessed by it, but Uh, Macy, if you would like to share about uh, your experience at that home. To me, the most important part of the trip was also going to people's houses. The favorite house that I went to was the house with twins. One was deaf, and both of them had autism. I noticed that at the end of being with them, that the the one that is not deaf knows the ABCs in English, so we all started to sing the ABCs with her. And the one that is deaf was really cute, and we bought bubbles for her. And most of the time we were there at her house, we were blowing bubbles for her, and she loved them. I learned that even though one was deaf and both of them had autism, they were still happy. Thanks, girls. You guys can go down there. Thank you. 
Um, so yeah, the home visits were an extremely impactful uh, part of the trip. My kids are troopers. We spent all day long going throughout this mountain village, uh, mountain city, um, making making our way to these homes across the city. And it was it was not easy. It's hot there. Uh, it's very different than here. Um, and it was uh, it, they were troopers though. Um, much of the trip was was not easy. It was a very full trip, but it was a very good, very good experience. Uh, then Wednesday we went to, um, or no, Tuesday, after the home visits, we went to a Young Life camp. You guys familiar with Young Life? It's a ministry that started in the U.S. Uh, it's an outreach to public schools. Uh, this camp is up in the mountains in Matagalpa. And um, we, we went there. Anna, who leads the Tesoros uh, Outreach Center in Matagalpa, used to work here. And so she was able to set it up that we were able to tour the facility. And uh, they are also have a coffee farm on the facility. So I was obviously very interested in that, being a coffee roaster. Um, and so we went to, the, to Young Life. And full transparency, I don't know if you guys feel this way also, but oftentimes when I hear a Christian... Uh, you know, ministry that's doing a little business on the side, I'm, I didn't have much expectation, just going to be honest. Like, they probably, like, do a good job, but, you know, it's a ministry. Um, and so we get there, and we stand, and we're, we're, we meet the gentleman that leads the coffee farm, and he starts off by saying, uh, you know, we, we have a farm, we have 90,000 plants, but our ministry is not coffee. Our ministry is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ here upon the earth, and coffee is one way that we do it. Uh, and I've got tears streaming down my face as he's talking about it. And he's telling me about the culture that they've created with the farmers. So the farmers are given a government-sized bucket that, they are, um, that they're required a minimum wage for in order to pick the cherries off of the coffee trees. And um, they, they pay something like 40% higher than minimum wage. Uh, to the to the workers on this farm, and their coffee is specialty grade coffee. It's if there's any coffee nerds in the room, they score uh, anything above an 80 is specialty grade, and it scores close to a 90 um, on the scale, which is not a very common coffee. It's like what you would get at maybe Madcap or something in town, um, and so it's just extremely high quality coffee, and they are spreading the gospel of Jesus by doing that. And so we we met them. Uh, if you go to the next slide here. Uh, many of the workers here at the farm um, actually were children that were in gangs that came to visit the Young Life camp. So they would go to this camp for a week, and they would give their lives to Jesus and now have become uh, workers in the camp. One of the directors was actually was uh, a leader in a gang, had been stabbed before. He said he had done a bunch of violent things that he didn't go into detail with. Um, but it, was, it wasn't until he came to Young Life that they think that it's just like a you know, a, a good trip away. They get to go have fun, maybe with all of their friends. But through the programming of this camp, Jesus starts pulling and drawing upon their hearts. And he was sitting there watching a skit and uh, didn't really realize what was happening. But as he's watching the skit, he starts feeling a bunch of heat in his body. Tears start streaming down his face, and he went running back to his camp. And uh, all of his gang members thought that maybe there was a fight or something that was going to go on. So they all went with him to go and figure out what was going on. Like, it was time to throw down. Who hurt, who hurt our friend? And they found out that he gave his life to Jesus, and now he's a leader here at this Young Life camp. Uh, just powerful, powerful testimonies, one after another. Um, of, of our time here at the Young Life Camp. So thank you very much for everybody. I could share pictures and stories all day. There's, there's plenty more, um, but I just wanted to give some highlights of our time here. Uh, but on our way back, we were coming back to, to the States. We were, we were supposed to come back on uh, Wednesday and found out that there was some snow up here in Grand Rapids and uh, made the decision to stay down there in the 80-degree weather. It was tough. It was really tough. Um, and so we delayed our flight one more day um, and before coming back. But it kind of sparked some conversation that we had with our family while we were there with my brother-in-law and, and sister-in-law and, and talked about their kids. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, what is it like for you guys here 
and how, how has this been? And, and my brother-in-law, he starts talking about, um, you know, just the blessing that they're able to have uh, to be able to pour into the lives of the, the students, to be involved in the community. And then he started talking about his kids and what they're able to experience. He said, but, you know, one of the hardest things for us that I didn't really think think or realize is just the lack of opportunity that my children are going to have for simple things that we take for granted, like sports programs. They don't have sports programs here. Uh, or music lessons. They don't, they don't provide, they don't have regular music lessons like we have here, or a theater program. And, uh, and so it was just some of those simple opportunities that their kids aren't going to be able to have. And as I'm thinking, I'm like, man, I just invested all this money to get my kids away from that so they can see the reality of what it's like for most of the world. And uh, throughout the, our trip there, there was probably three days where we didn't have any running water. Um, the, the city uh, in Nicaragua actually turns the water off to the residents. Uh, and hopefully you have a backup. Like if, if you don't, you just don't have water. Um, outside of everybody's homes, oftentimes there are little water towers that are, that are up uh, that when the city water's on, it goes up, and it's kind of like a, a reserve that you that you can tap into. But the city wasn't turning the water on uh, with enough pressure to even fill those water towers while we were there. So we went three days, no shower. Uh, there was a public pool in their compound that became a, a, a gathering place for the neighbors. Um, and uh, But as every time I would see my sister-in-law, she would turn the faucet on to see, and I could see that they, like, like they were fine with it, but it was the fact that they had guests. They wanted to make sure that we were comfortable, and we decided before we went, like, whatever happens, happens. It was not a big deal for us at all. Um, and so, but she would turn the faucet on, and I would hear her say to herself, we chose this. No water. We chose this. And she'd turn it off, and that's okay, not a big deal. And then we go and she'd realize, oh, man, we have to do all of the laundry from our trip to the volcano. We, we have no way of doing laundry except for going to somebody else's home that maybe does have water reserve. And, and she's talking, I'd hear her say under her breath, oh, but we chose this, we chose this. And then on our final night when we were there, as, I was, as we were talking, she brought that up and she said, you know, it's really not that bad. I, I, was on, I grew up in the, some time on the missions field as well. You know, this is a third world country, like I mentioned. But she said, uh, she said, but all I have to do is I have to remind myself that we chose this. We chose not, they didn't choose no water. They didn't choose no opportunities for their kids. But what they did choose was to love the people in the nation of Nicaragua. And everything else then doesn't really matter because they chose out of love what they were going to do. And we're in the middle right now of our stewardship series. And, I was, and as she was saying that, I kept thinking about the fact of what stewardship is like. Like this is where stewardship, where the rubber actually meets the road. Stewardship becomes the bridge, the intersection between love and of action, of faith and of works. It's not just saying I love people, but it's actually showing that love through their action. And so she's saying over and over and over again, we chose this. Now the power of stewardship lies, on, lies within our freedom and our ability to choose to be faithful, to choose to actually love. The Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one life for his friends. Every day, as they are there, they are choosing to lay down their lives in love. See, love without actual action is nothing more than lip service. In the same way that oftentimes we talk about action without love can lead to legalism. But love without action, it's just like I've never felt like waking up in the morning and bringing my kids to school. I'm just going to be honest. I'm, never, I'm not a morning person. I'm never like, oh, I can't wait to get up early to bring my kids to school. <laughs> I cannot wait to do the dishes today. I cannot wait to cook and, and to clean up and to do all the things that I need to do to show love. But, but, but it's a reality that love requires action on our parts in the same way that Jesus modeled what true love looks like to lay down his life. 
James 2 says that thus faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Verse 11 says this, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. This is Jesus. He's entering into Jerusalem before his crucifixion. And because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately, the Jewish people thought that Jesus was going to Jerusalem at this time to establish his kingdom here upon this earth. But he shares this parable with them to show them like, now's not the time, but I will be back. And he says this, therefore he said, a certain nobleman, speaking of himself in this story, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, Having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, saying that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. A mina is a sum of money that was equal to about three months' salary at that time. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you are faithful and very little, have authority over ten cities." And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not. So why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and, and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has, will be taken away. But bring here those enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, and slay them before me. But Daddy God, good, good Father, this doesn't sound too much like you in this moment. (laughs) Bring those enemies to me and slay them before me. He's saying this, Pastor Kathy a few weeks ago pointed out that with this same set of passages, that the servant that did nothing had a skewed image of who Jesus was. That he was driven by fear and out of his fear responded by doing absolutely nothing. You see, we are called, regardless of how we feel, to bring a return for what it is that God has has given to us. You know, on that final day, the excuse of I didn't feel like it isn't going to go over very well. The excuse of, but I had fear because of the way I was raised. See, he didn't actually say, well, why do you have fear? Come here and sit down in my lap. He says, no, you didn't do with anything with what I had given you. You chose the safe route instead of the route that I called you to. See, our fear isn't an excuse on that final day. I know it's tough to hear. But this is in Scripture. God has called each and every one of us to actually do with what it is that we have been given, to actually present back to him something of value with what he has given us in our lives. You know, over this last uh, two or three years, I'm kind of zipping through this because I I realize our time already, Um, but over this last two or three years, uh, my family has really made a big emphasis on rest. We, we experienced a lot of burnout, and, and COVID, though a very difficult thing, was a very needed thing for our family. Uh, extremely hard, but it was a great revealer of our hearts. It was a great revealer of what our motivations were, what our, where our focus was on, what we were trying to build. And so we decided as a family that we were going to practice rest. We were going to live from a place of rest. And and you've heard me uh, preach messages on this before over the last couple of years. But see, if if I just said to you that my family practiced rest, you may have heard me saying my my family stopped working so hard. See, but rest has nothing to do with what I am doing. It has much more to do with who I am doing it for. 
Rest in its purest form is actually a recognition that I am doing his work here upon the earth, not building for my own kingdom, for my own gain, for my own, for my own self-esteem. And so what we started to do, Jesus actually said it like this. He says in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See, Jesus, sneaky as he is, he says, come and rest, for take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He's referring to yoke that oxen would put upon their necks to connect them together to plow the ground. So Jesus says this, come to me if you want rest. He doesn't say, because I've got good naps in your future. He says, I will come and put you to my work. I will come and give you the works of the kingdom for you to actually walk in. See, you've been working on your own, trying to build your own kingdom, but if you come and plow my ground the way that I'm trying to plow it, there you are going to find your rest. It's not whether we are doing or not doing, it's who we are doing it for and what we are actually doing here upon this earth that matters. If you're feeling burnout, if you're feeling exhausted, if maybe your emotions are overwhelming you, then it's time to evaluate what works you are working on. It's time to evaluate where our focus actually is. See, my sister-in-law, she says, we chose this. Here, if my water turned off, I remember we were without power for three days, and I was ready to tear down the whole house. Like, it was, you know, we don't have power, and it's, the, the whole world has just come to a standstill. But there, that was just a byproduct of her love. You see, the things that become hard, the sufferings that we feel that we experience in this life become much much easier when we're doing it with purpose, with intention, when we're actually focused on building his kingdom. Rest in its truest form takes place when we are walking in his will over our lives. And so I was thinking of this, of this scripture of the, the man that was caught in fear, and you know, I, I get it. I know what it's like to to have our emotions that are extremely overwhelming, that are maybe we, we've, we're in depression or anxiety or fear or whatever it is. It wasn't an excuse to not do it. Our emotions are meant to be nothing more than gauges, not masters. If there is something that's taking place in our heart that's off, that's, that's, that's not right, an emotion that's overwhelming us, then it is our job to steward it and to tell it where to go. Because his truth speaks much louder than the emotions that we are experiencing in our life. You know, when we were there, we led worship at that church, the missionary church. And um, it was not a very charismatic bunch of people as far as, um, you know, during worship, they were extremely expressive. They were, but they were there. They were committed to what it was that God called them to do. And I looked around the room and I just saw such peace in the room during the message. No legs shaking, no, you know, twitching and everything that I do. And and where I'm like, all right, if you guys have seen me go back and forth on this stage probably a hundred times since I've started talking. And I just saw the level of commitment in the room is what it spoke to me. I I just did it again. I saw a level of commitment to truth in the room. You see, whether or not there were a bunch of expressive people, whether or not they were all in with with their bodies, with their emotions, they were all in with their life. It was that the truth of Jesus spoke louder than the emotions that they were experiencing. The truth of what he has called them to look like love put into action, them giving their entire lives for the people of Nicaragua. And I was just so inspired as I was thinking about that. And, and, uh, you know, we, we definitely in our stream are a very emotional people. I, I love expressive worship. I believe that we're going to be extremely expressive in heaven. So if we're going to do it there, we might as well do it here. All about it. But what I am not all about is letting myself do absolutely nothing because I don't feel like it. What I'm not all about is roller coaster up and down one day, the next day, turn left, turn right, feel this, feel that Christianity. What I am about is Jesus modeled that it was to lay down our lives, to show what love actually looks like. You know, I'm not going to be sitting on the couch going, good luck, honey, I love you. 
Good luck with the kids. I love you. Good luck taking them to school every day. I love you, though. I promise I do. I'll show you when I feel like it. (laughs) It's funny, but we live that way. We actually show Jesus that reality with the way that we live our lives. We're waiting until we feel called into doing what it is that we're doing. Instead of actually taking, digging deep into the things that are within us, using our intellect, actually being disciplined in the areas that God has called us into. If you've been called into business, you better buy every business book possible and get into it. If you feel like you've been called to raise a family, buy every family book that you can think of. And dig deep into that. You see, for whatever reason, in the charismatic world, we think that that's works. Absolutely. God said in his word in Ephesians 2 that we have been saved by faith for something. For good works. Which have been prepared for us beforehand. That we should actually walk in them. This salvation that we live is not just to get to heaven. It's to actually expand his kingdom here upon this earth. And now here's the beauty of it. Here's here's the beauty of it, that my humanity might take me here, and I know that his grace can take me there. We need to do everything, though, in our own ability to actually sacrifice our lives for the sake of his gospel. Not caring more about the fun that we're having in the activities, but caring more about what it looks like to love, regardless if we feel like it or not. You know, in my marriage, it would look very, it would be a very poor marriage if I loved my wife based on how I felt. Because some days I'm tired. Some days I'm exhausted. Some days I, I, I don't want to do anything. But I still do. I still show up. And I'm sure there are days that I don't. But I repent from those and I get back up again. And I continue to show up. I felt so strongly while I was gone that, that, that it is time for this church to show up. It's time for this church to show up whether we feel like it or not. It's time to not be mastered by our emotions, but put them under the slavery of his truth and tell our emotions on where they need to go. Whether you feel like it or not, he has called you to lay down your life for him. Not to love him in word only, but actually in, in our actions. And he's planning on rewarding us accordingly. We may be able to get to heaven based upon faith alone, but the the rewards that we are going to have in our next life, in eternity, it says that you are given authority over ten cities based on what you did while he was gone. Highlight that over and over again. See, this doesn't match up, though, with my vision, my version of Western Good, good father. You see, I believe that the, that we have been robbed by focusing on one really good aspect of God. He is so loving. He is caring. He is long-suffering. He is never going to give up on you. He is going to continue chasing you down over and over and over again. But at some point, we also need to realize that he is going to reward us according to our works here upon this earth. It's not going to earn your way into heaven, but it will dictate what eternity looks like for you. That's what my Bible says. That's what it says, whether I like it or not. Jesus was speaking to himself when he said, bring those enemies before me as I slay them in front of you. So I want to pray over us as a community. That our emotions, that our feelings, that our thoughts would come into alignment with his will over our lives. Look, I am all for, as I said, I, I'm all for going after and seeking out healthy emotions, seeking out health in, in soul. But I have to do that according to his truth. I have to bring his truth to my emotions, not the other way around. What I feel is not true. What his word says is true. And if I'm feeling something that's contrary to what his word says, then I'm the one that needs to change, not his word. His word becomes the thing that I have to aspire to become like. His word becomes becomes the, the standard that I have to continuously steward in my heart to transform in the image of, by his grace and by his mercy every single day. Would you stand? Father, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity that I had 
that we had as a family to go down to Nicaragua and to see what it's like for people to give it all for your gospel, to lay down the comforts of West America, uh, West Michigan, of Western civilization, of the United States. I, I didn't mention this, but it's the poorest, but they did a study on the people of Nicaragua, and they found that it is the happiest nation in Central America. That the people there have found joy in things other than just their stuff. So, Father, I pray that you would teach us, strip away our comforts. Strip away the things that we are relying on that are keeping us from serving you wholeheartedly. I heard it said once that, Jesus, you came to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. I ask that you would afflict the areas of comfort in our lives, Jesus. That your cross would, would, would drive deep into those areas. That when we experience suffering, we're not surprised because your Bible says that we are to experience suffering. That when we experience persecution, it's not because of a lack of faith on our end, but it's because of the promises that are in your scripture. That we would say steadfast, regardless of what is happening in our lives, we are continuing to pursue you and your kingdom here upon this earth. Lord, I pray that you would make us healthy, that you would make us healthy in emotion and heart. Lord, but Father, I ask that we wouldn't wait to be whole till we're able to actually do something for your kingdom. Your word says to seek first the kingdom of heaven and righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And we know that all the other stuff will fall in line as we do that. We submit our lives to you, to your gospel. We submit our lives and we lay down all comforts, all pride, all self-ambition, and all selfish motivations. And I pray, Lord, that we would truly become the church of Jesus Christ, that we would shine bright here upon this earth, that we would continue seeking after you, continue showing this world what true, sacrificial, laid-down love looks like. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.